I know, I know what kind of authority does some random YouTuber who kind of convinced people he's got a girlfriend have to tell you everything you need to know about Raptors? Well, I myself have been known to be a clever girl at times. So I'm continuing my series looking at entire groups rather than individual animals and it is now time to look at dromaeosaurs, more commonly known as raptors. Before we begin though, I just want to clear up one thing. The term raptors is an informal and flexible one. So this term was originally used to refer to birds of prey as it literally translates to thief, but in recent times it's been adopted as part of the genus names for a lot of non-avian dinosaurs thanks to certain dinosaurs being more famous than the term's original use, especially since Jurassic Park, the association for the word raptor has now been with the group of dinosaurs that we'll be talking about in this video. Also, be sure to stick around to the end to find out about a new segment I'll be doing for these videos and how you can get involved. But in the scientific binomial sense, this word has been used for any dinosaur that is thought to have lived a predatory lifestyle meaning that not every dinosaur with the word raptor in its name necessarily belongs to the group that we're talking about today. For example, Megaraptor or Oviraptor. Having said that, for the sake of ease in this video, if I do name drop the word raptor, just know that I'm using it to refer to the Dromaeosaurs, unless I state otherwise. Housekeeping done, let's get into it. The group of Dromaeosaurs, or more specifically Dromaeosauridae, are a group of Silurian theropods that flourished during the Cretaceous at various points in the world, made famous by the aforementioned film Jurassic Park with the quote-unquote Velociraptors. So, what does it take to join the raptor club? Well, dromaeosaurs, like all groups of organisms, have both general features that most members have and diagnostic features that they need to be classified as a member of that group. For dromaeosaurs, the diagnostic features are short T-shaped bones that form the rostral boundary at the supertemporal fenestra, a contact between the quadrate and the quadratojugal, specialised tail vertebra, the presence of a depression in the coracoid bone, and of course a specialised pedal digit or toe claw, forming a large sickle-shaped claw that is constantly raised off the floor. Okay, I promise that is as technical as I'm going to get. Don't switch off me now. Generally, dromaeosaurs were small to medium-sized predators, for dinosaurs that is, with relatively long claws on the forelimbs that could fold against the body like modern birds, though with hands that could not pronate downwards like we often see, long very stiff tails and a light fast build for speedy running. The skulls were fairly typical for theropods at a glance, with long snouts lined with small recurved and serrated teeth and long V-shaped skulls that provided a certain level of binocular vision. Then there's the famous massive toe claw. Again, this was constantly held up off the floor in order to keep its shape in a similar manner to cat claws, meaning that the dromaeosaurs left unmistakable didactyl footprints. Now the size of dromaeosaurids vary between different species. The smallest guys were microraptors, which by the way is not a type of raptor you can just keep in your Gucci handbag, of which Xiongianosaurus is the smallest at just 80 centimeters or 34.5 inches long and just 300 grams in weight. As we go through to the more typical dromaeosaur, famous members such as Velociraptor, Dromaeosaurus, and Deinonychus get to be around 4.5 to 8 feet long, roughly reaching between an average human's knee and waist. Then we start getting to the big boys, with the largest dromaeosaurs such as Ostraraptor, Achillobator, the controversial Dakotaraptor, and the famous Utahraptor, reaching up to 6 meters or 20 foot in length and in the case of Utah Raptor being the heaviest, around the same weight of a polar bear. Now these were the largest named dromaeosaurs, but it is thought that this group could have gotten even bigger thanks to some isolated teeth found in the Isle of Wight here in the UK. But nothing has been named from these fragmentary remains, so it's not a definite. So how did they come to be? Well, we have to look a little further back at a clade known as Paravis. This is a group defined as all theropods more closely related to birds than to oviraptorsaurs. Vague, I know. This group originated in the Middle Jurassic around 165 million years ago, when the group diverged from other theropods, eventually splitting into modern birds following Archaeopteryx, Truodontids, and Dromaeosaurs. Now, the relationship between birds, Truodontids, and Dromaeosaurs is debated, 
So we don't actually know whether Germanosaurs diverged earlier on than birds and troodontids, or if birds diverged earlier on and Germanosaurs are more closely related to troodontids. Another unanswered question about Germanosaurs is not only when they originated, but where. No body fossils have been recovered from anywhere earlier than the Cretaceous, but by this point they were already being found across Europe, North America, Asia, Africa, and possibly even Australia. So they must have radiated around the globe when Pangaea was still around, crossing over the land bridges that didn't break apart until the early Cretaceous. So this would imply origins and a quick success during the Jurassic, and isolated teeth from this time that are thought to be Germanosaurs were also found in England. So it appears that this group may have had European origins. What we do know with a little more clarity is what this group were getting up to by the late Cretaceous. What their lifestyle was like is something that has been hotly debated over the decades. The bird-like nature of this group that was first made famous by John Ostrom during the 1960s got many paleontologists wondering how bird-like their lifestyle was. We have evidence for many species being as covered in feathers as modern birds are, so much so that it's assumed that all Dromaeosaurs had this level of entanglement. I know there's a few people that commented on my Deinonychus video saying, well it wasn't found with feathers so why are we putting them on it? So look, I know that Deinonychus or another Dromaeosaur might have been an outlier in this, but I mean, come on, we don't have actual evidence for fur on Smilodon, and I don't see anyone thinking that that thing was bald. Quick rant over. Point is, what were they doing? Well, most dromaeosaurs were living as medium-sized terrestrial predators, with some living arboreally, aka in trees, as gliders. In fact, Microraptor, the four-winged gliding dromaeosaur that we actually know the colour of, has been found to be the most basal raptor found leading some scientists to suggest that Germanosaurs actually evolved from tree-dwelling gliders and becoming secondarily fully terrestrial or, in the case of Hauscoraptorines, semi-aquatic. But with such variety of lifestyles, there's still one thing that's always a constant with raptors, and that is the toe claw. So what was it for? Seems a silly question, right? It's a stabby thing. Well, the exact function of this toe claw is actually something that has been questioned for quite some time. Initially, it was inferred that these claws were for slashing kicks, but this fell more and more out of favour as suggestions came in for more of a hook function, aiding raptors in stabbing rather than slashing and aiding in holding onto the flanks of larger animals. Other functions were suggested and tested from tree climbing to digging for smaller animals and burrows. The reconstructed models created and tested in 2019 seem to suggest that the ways in which these claws were utilised most effectively were for close quarters gripping meaning they could restrain smaller prey or even climb on larger prey. Using it to climb trees sounds weird, but if the suggestion that they evolved from arboreal tree climbs is true, then the famous raptor toe claw is likely something that was initially evolved for tree climbing and kept by later, larger species for holding on to prey. The close quarters model is also consistent with the famous fight in dinosaurs, in which the velociraptor's legs are flexed as its toe claw is embedded into the protoceratops' neck. Pack behaviour is another thing that is debated and seems to vary between genera, so be sure to check out my Utah Raptor and Deinonychus videos to find out each individual case. And there you have it, pop culture icons brought just a little bit closer to the real world from what we know about the real animals, which I think is a lot cooler. Let me know what you thought of this video and if you want to support this channel I will leave a link to my Patreon down in the description where some of the benefits you can get is early access to these videos a chance to vote on the kind of content I do, and also priority for this new segment that I'm doing, Question Time. For example, today's question comes from patron Gregory Beaton, and he asks, what living bird or birds do you consider to be the closest living relatives of dinosaurs, and how does that inform our view of how actual dinosaurs may have looked and behaved? That's a great question to kick this off with, so thank you for that. Okay, so... Uh, modern birds are the only group of dinosaurs to survive the KPG. And we don't actually know what exact group gave rise to modern birds, but we do know that they would have evolved from one or at least very few groups during around the early Cretaceous. Basically from one group that early on during the Cretaceous basically means that all modern birds are as closely related to non-avian dinosaurs as each other. So yeah, in terms of phylogenetic relationships, there's no single bird that, or single group of birds 
that is more closely related to dinosaurs than any other one. But we can look at certain groups in terms of how basal they are. Basically, birds are a group that are hardly derived from the rest of dinosaurs. So we want to look at which groups split off early on and retain more basal characteristics. Which is a tough one because the best answer I can come up with are the paleognaths, which are your ostriches, emus, uh, cassowaries, etc. But they are actually convergently basal since all birds descended from the Aviolae, which were all animals much like Archaeopteryx. So they basically evolved back to being ground-dwelling, large and robust, and they even have more sporadic feather covering. So TLDW, I would say that in terms of body morphology, the giant ground birds are probably the closest dinosaurian analogue we have. This can infer certain things like how aggressive they may have been, or how they use display or defence structures. But not much in terms of diet, because most of this group are herbivores and behaviours do vary a lot. So we can infer a bit, but not a lot. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed that little segment, and if you've got a question you want answering, check out the community tab where you can comment your question on the post I did for this. Or if you want priority, again, check out the Patreon link down below. Catch you guys next time.